If you don't have a reason to be joyful, let me give you one. Um, uh, you know that you drove home and nothing happened to you? You kind of understand that you went to sleep and you didn't even know what was happening and you woke up. Amen, amen, amen. And, and you can understand that um, even that you're here now in your right mind. That, amen, um, amen. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so if you don't have nothing to give God thanks that's for, right. I want to welcome you today in the worship. I want to welcome you on the Sabbath. I want to welcome you wherever you are. You're on the internet watching, you're here in church. I just want to welcome you. And believe me, I'm not even trying to put on this voice and be loud. I'm really happy. Amen. Because Amen. I've seen Amen. so many things happen this week. And I want to welcome you in the house of the Lord. Welcome you online. And may you be blessed this day on this um, Sabbath day. And Amen. 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 Church. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. And happy Sabbath, boys and girls who are online. Well, today I'll be telling the children's story, and it's a story about two little girls named Christy and Jada. Now, Christy and Jada would love to go into their mother's closet and look inside this box. This box would be filled with items that they would like to go with. Sometimes the box would be full, and sometimes the box would be empty, but they always like to check and see. Now, in this particular time, their mother would take their winter clothes and put it downstairs so they knew that the box would be full. And the box of clothes that their mother would take to the Goodwill or to the church to give to children who are in need. But before she would give them away, she would let them play their favorite game, dress up. They'll go and take items out of the box and dress like members in high society, or they'll dress up like supermodels or like they go into the fancy restaurants and drive in limousines, <laughs> big limousines. They like to dress up like they're in co different careers, like a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. They will sometimes even get their brother Jason and his friend Brian to dress up with them, and they'll dress act like they're <laughs> sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Act like they're. Like they're getting, <laughs> they're getting married, or that they start a family. And time is sorry to say that sometimes, as a child, it may be fun to think about what it would be like when you grow up. Sometimes it's fun to think and act like an adult, or to think like an adult. But there's a verse in Ecclesiastes 11 verse 9 that says, Be happy, young man, in your youth, and be happy in the joy in the days when you were young. And the wise men Solomon said this. He said this to say that you should enjoy being a child. And there's plenty of things that you can do as a child. And to look forward to you as a child is your job to be there for your family and to be with them as they were. <laughs> and play is your job to learn everything that you can do I love the world and everyone in it. It is your job to make friends and learn how to get along with people. It is your job to develop your skills for Christ and to learn <laughs> and to learn how to be, how to use your skills for Him. And God wants you to know that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. God wants you to know that he will be with you every step of the way in whatever that you do and that whatever you choose to be when you grow up, he will be there for you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here and for the people that are lined up are here, Lord. Be with every single child and every single older child here and bless their hearts, Lord. Be with us all individually and help us to continue to grow in your word and to be more like you each and every day. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
How's everyone doing this morning? Great. 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 All right. Great. All right. Great. We're going to sing some praises to the Lord this morning. Amen. And um, my voice is a little shaky because I decided to get the tip this week. So give me cough. Right. <laughs> FYI. Um, so this morning we're going to start by singing Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, my Lord is mine. We have to pray and read the Bible and ask Him to 
2017, he was uh, elected an elder, and he served for two years before he was um, he was um, dedicated an elder for that church in 2019. He is the co-founder, and I know this for a fact because I share the pictures, right? Um, the, co the co-founder of a business of a of a label called. Um, uh, it's herb and it's um, herb spice, a small business. Um, he's a co-founder on the ASI, and their mission here is to bring nutrition for children and adults. The thing about it is, I want you to check it out. He has a really, really, really good spice, man. It's actually whole food, right? It's on the shelf. You don't want to say anything about that, but it's where it's at. I mean. We gotta support our own, but um, brother, the elder here, he has he has been serving. And one thing I tell you, um, as a young person, he has always been there. He is constant, and I pray to God that as he uses him today to minister our heart, just just give us that. You know, we need that, right? Just 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 give us that, and allow Christ to be praised. Amen. Amen. Amen.
everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Brother Jeff, for the introduction. And I, I've been blessed uh, to be here. Uh, this is the second or, no, actually third time I've been in church in about six months. Uh, so it's definitely a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Um, thankful to see everyone here. I uh, want to give us a real special greeting to a friend of mine, uh, Brother Sean. Uh, we went to elementary school together, actually, uh, in uh, Herlock, Maryland. So uh, good to see you, Brother Sean. <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for, uh, again, allowing me to come and share with you uh, from God's Word. And I, I know why I'm here. You know, you always, I talk to the Lord and I ask the Lord, you know, to show me, you know, how you're leading me, why you're leading me, you know, why am I going there? And I can see why I'm here. Um, I almost want to change the sermon title to Battle Cry. Amen. Amen. You guys got that, right? Amen. The Battle Cry, amen. amen. But I'll save that for uh, uh, for the church, amen? amen. So I'll just begin with a word of prayer um, before we get into the message for this afternoon. If you can just join me in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so privileged and honored to be again in your house of prayer for all people. You have been gracious toward us. You have given us hope and you've given us peace in the storm. We're praying now for your Holy Ghost to come in our hearts, take control of our minds, our thoughts, and may we be made pure. May we be sanctified. We're asking that your angels will also come and dwell with us. We know that your angels are present. We're praying, Father, that you will make it clear to us that you have a word for us this afternoon. Please, Lord, forgive us as well for our sins, and we ask for your righteousness, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The hour has come. The hour has come. We're starting out in the book of John, chapter 2, verse 40. John, chapter 2, and verse 40. It says, Jesus said unto her, his mother, What have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. So Jesus is here now putting the brakes on. He is bringing a realization to his life mission. What was the point that Jesus is, is making here? What is the main point that Jesus is trying to make? This was at the wedding that took place when Jesus first began his ministry. And the lesson here that Jesus is trying to make clear, we find him essentially repeating what he has said already 18 years before. The point that Jesus is trying to make while he was 30 at this time, a young man, is the same point, the same lesson that he was trying to teach and also to be a witness to or exemplify in his life as a 12-year-old child, as a child. Can a 12-year-old child teach and be an example? Can a 6th or a 7th grader teach and be an example. Let's find out, amen. 
I want you to go to the, the scripture reading with me, please, in Luke chapter 2, verses 49 through 52. And I'm just going to read it again. Okay. And Jesus is 12 years old at this time. And he said unto them, How is it that ye saw me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. I must be about my father's business. This was Jesus recognizing and realizing that his mission was clearly laid out for him already. And that he understood it how? Through the word of God, through prayer, and through observing what he had witnessed going down to Jerusalem for the very first time as a 12-year-old young man, seeing his mission played out before his very eyes and all of the services that were the types pointing to him, the antitype. He noticed that, he realized that, he understood that at 12 years old. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to break it down some more. He realized that at that very time, he must be about his father's business. And that realization never left him throughout those entire 18 years up until he reached 30. And at that marriage when his dear mother, Mary, had somewhat of a misunderstanding, he lovingly reminded her that his hour had not yet come. Or in other words, that he had a mission that was specifically outlined in detail by God before the foundation of the world. But notice how he, at 12, behaved, even with you can say this advanced understanding. It says in verse 50, he went down with them and was subject unto them. Amen? Yeah. Children, are you subject unto your parents? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 and let's read verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. And it says, children, obey your parents always. That's another verse, right? But what does this one say? It says, obey your parents in the Lord. Amen? Amen. For this is right. Continuing, it says in verse 2, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Obedience was something that Christ understood as a child. Loving obedience to his parents. Submission. And you know, this is so important. Uh, now, you know, um, I've, I've heard testimonies from teachers who are, um, you know, they don't have the children with them in the classroom at this time. Where, where are the children? They're at home, right? They're with their parents, right? So if there was ever a time when this principle is necessary, now more than ever, amen? 
now more than ever. And I want to expand on it some more. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 25, gives the same thoughts, but I want to just expand it now more into the entire home circle. It says, Wives, submit unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that, the, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Amen? Amen. So we see here clearly Christ as a young boy at the age of 12, a young man being subject unto his parents. Loving his parents, honoring his parents in the Lord. So he was not only uh, when he said, I must be about my father's business, it included loving obedience to his parents in the Lord. Amen. This applies to all young people, amen? amen? And this, we realize, I realize now more than ever uh, as an older uh, young man. And, you know, I have to confess, I have to... Uh, Confess that I wasn't uh, an obedient child. And you know, I could go down and share different reasons why and so on and so forth. But one thing I am seeing now as an adult, as someone who has surrendered their heart to the Lord, is how important obedience is. Amen. 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 It is a matter of life and death. Amen. And, you know, I wish I had learned when I was young. But God is merciful, amen? amen. And today, amen, God, if you so choose today, God can begin to teach you or he will continue to teach you today loving obedience to him. And for children, obedience to their parents. Amen? amen. We're going to see the fruit of this. We're going to see the fruit of this as we continue looking in the Word of God this afternoon. Going back now to Luke chapter 2, verses 49 through 52, it says, verse, continuing in verse 50, But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. Here we see again what was included in the thought that Jesus was trying to teach and exemplify of being about his father's business was to increase in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And we don't have time to break all that down this afternoon, but I would encourage us, I'm going to make an appeal at this time to, for everyone, especially the young people, to, if you haven't read, and if you have, go read it again. Because what I found is that you may read something once, but as you grow, you go back and read it again, and you will get a brand new revelation. It will be as though it's like a new 
gift that you have received that you always wanted. Going back and reviewing the Word of God, I want to recommend to all the young people here a book. It's a large book, all right? But you can read one chapter. I recommend one chapter. And it's chapter 9. All right? Chapter 9. Actually, verse chapter 7 and 9. Of a book called The Desire of Ages. Chapter 7 is called As a Child. One of the most powerful chapters you ever read about the life of a child. And then chapter 9 is called Days of Conflict. We're in a conflict right now with this COVID-19 crisis. And if you go read that chapter, it will give you encouragement, instruction, and direction of how to navigate through this crisis in the home. And I don't have all the numbers, I don't have all the statistics, but I can tell you that since the crisis has begun, there have been more challenges and more issues in Homes. Yeah. Conflicts in homes. And if anyone can help us to overcome these challenges and conflicts in our homes, it is Christ. Amen. Amen. And I want to I want to read something just from that chapter, chapter nine, Days of Conflict, from page 86, paragraph one. It says, at a very early age. Jesus had begun to act for himself in the formation of his character. And not even respect and love, which are essential, for his parents could turn him from obedience to God's word. It is written was his reason for every act that varied from family customs. But the influence of the rabbis made his life a bitter one. Even in his youth, he had to learn the hard lesson of silence and patient endurance. And this is important for all of us, whether we're young or old. We must learn how to form a character after the pattern of God for ourselves. Amen. Yes, there are others that are seeking to help you form a good Christian character. Amen? Amen. Amen. Family members, church leaders, elders, pastors, mentors. But friends, we must as individuals, young people, you must begin now to form your character for yourself. Because really, we can help, we can encourage, we can be an example, but ultimately, you have to choose. It is your decision. God is not going to force us. He's going to draw us with his love. And he wants to persuade us Amen. by his Holy Ghost and through others. But it is your decision. And I promise you that if you make the right choice, you will see good fruit. Guarantee that. We're going to see that in life, in Christ's life, if we haven't seen it yet. Now I'm going to go back to the wedding. The wedding party. At this wedding party, at that time, weddings lasted almost a week, according to the customs of the time. There was much celebration and there was much. Uh, social a gathering. And at this wedding, they ran out of wine. Right? And I want to put in a plug here. It wasn't part of the message, but just a brief plug. It was pure grape juice. Unfermented. Not a taint of alcohol. 
It was pure, fresh, new wine right from the grapes. Amen? Why am I saying that? Because I remember when I was 18 years old, and I was in my first year of college, and I was sitting in a classroom, and I went to a secular university, and somehow we were in a literature class, and it came up about this wedding party. And one person in the class said, well, you know, Jesus drunk uh, wine, they were implying alcoholic wine. And I was sitting there like, yeah, he did. Surely I didn't have understand. So it is, it is critical, it is imperative to know these Bible truths so that you do not follow the multitude to talk or to do evil. It is, it is imperative to know exactly what the Bible teaches. Amen? Amen. Amen? So, if you have any more questions on that, please see me afterward. We can study that out some more. But at this, at this wedding party, they ran out of wine, and uh, in the mind of Mary, the mother of Jesus, she had the hope that Jesus was going to become an earthly king, the earthly king of Israel, and also would overthrow the, the Roman rulers. This was, this, was the, this was her mind and her understanding of the mission of Jesus when he was 30. And all along, this was the actual understanding, general understanding of all of Israel. The nation of Israel had this understanding. They did not have a correct view of Bible prophecy. They misunderstood the clear prophecies in Isaiah chapter 53 where it talked about him as a lamb being brought to the slaughter. When, when Jesus was born, uh, if you were, Mary received messages from three different sources trying to help her understand what her son's mission was going to be. And it was hard to break through all the misunderstanding obviously that was pervading Israel. When Jesus said to her, when Jesus said to her clearly that I must be about my father's business when he was 12, the Bible says they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. How could this be? Right? How could it be? Now, there were so many miracles that took place, right? Even the birth of Jesus was a miracle. Uh, all those individuals, the angels who came to Mary, uh, not angels, but after Mary had Christ, angels came to the shepherds. And the shepherds came to Mary and started prophesying about Jesus. Then they go to the temple and Simeon now uh, begins to prophesy about Christ's mission. And the Bible says Mary pondered these things in her heart, right? And then uh, Anna the prophetess began to prophesy and about Christ and his mission, right? To give understanding. God was trying to get the people to understand the mission of Christ, the prophetic mission of Christ. The question for us today is, do we have understanding of the prophetic ministry of Christ? Do we understand what Christ is doing right now for us, according to the scriptures, according to prophecy? And have, lacking this understanding, missing this truth, is, is causing the need in this community right here, 
these thousands of homes that we know of, because they are lacking the proper understanding, people are losing hope. Individuals are losing hope. Family are losing, they're losing hope because they don't realize the Bible prophecies. It has application to our everyday life. It's not just a theory, but it actually affects our everyday life. I want to move on. I want to bring it more down to our day as well. <clears throat> the wedding party that Jesus attended. You know, obviously, Mary and his mother didn't understand Christ's mission. In our day, Mary's in our day, mothers in our day, do we understand the mission of our children? Do we understand what God is calling them to? Are we, are we praying? Are we, are we studying the Word of God? Are we studying the prophecies in the Word of God to know how to uh, direct our children properly so that they are able to fulfill the mission that God has for them? This is a question for us. Or, or are we uh, seeking to get them to do what we want them to do? Or what we think they should be doing? In the case and point of Mary with Jesus at the wedding party. A lot of us are in need of understanding of the prophecies in the Word of God. This whole idea of our, my hour has not come, that Jesus was trying to say was based on prophecy. It was actually based on time <laughs> prophecy as well. And, you know, when you study the books of Daniel, and you read, for example, Daniel chapter 9, and you really understand it, it, it should cause you to be, have a feeling that's indescribable. I can't even really describe it. It's so amazing. Because the accuracy... The detail, the love, the care, the compassion that God had for us to reveal specifically down to the date, even the time, the very hour of our Messiah, our Lord and Savior, His sacrifice was revealed. This should give us hope. Amen. This should cause us to have implicit, without any reserve, trust in God. Amen. This is the purpose of God revealing these things to us. My hour is not yet come. Jesus understood his hour. He understood the scriptures. He understood the prophecies. And it wasn't that it just fell down from heaven to him. Okay? It came through the Holy Ghost teaching him as he studied the Word of God as a child, as a young man. Putting this Word into use, into practical, everyday use. He said, I must be about my father's business. And you know, as a young man being 30 at a wedding party, and let me say a single young man, could it, could it have been that Mary was trying to get Jesus to do something to impress maybe a single young lady at the wedding party? You know, mothers naturally you know, are looking for a, a spouse or a wife for their sons, naturally, right? You know how we are at weddings, right? The singles at weddings, even the married married uh, persons at weddings, right? Looking to do match, you know, matchmaking, right? 
But Jesus was clear on his mission. He, he didn't allow anything to, to get in the way of his mission. And God prospered him. God led him exactly in the direction that he wanted him to go. This truth, these truths, point to the same principle. My hour is not yet come. I must be about my father's business. Point to the same principle of a complete daily surrender to the express will of God revealed where? In his word. In his holy word. Not by feeling or rapture. You know, sometimes we feel inspired to obey God, or we feel impressed to obey God, or to worship, or to praise, or to give thanks. It shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be a rapture. It should be continuous, consistent, at every moment, at every circumstance. This is how Jesus was as a child. And he knew both what to do and what not to do. He knew what to omit and what to commit. He knew when to go and when to stop. Amen? Amen. This is how God's Word can guide us. It can prevent us from falling. And it can help us to get up when we fall. God's word is our anchor. It is our source. And I want to move down now, coming down to the end and closing. I want to move to Christ's last six days on the earth. What would you do if you if you knew you only had six days to live? What would you do? Jesus knew, according to the word, he knew according to the word that his time was up, that his time was almost up. He was only 33 years old. He was a young man. Short life he lived, but very impactful. The fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness. A short but very impactful life. I want to go to John chapter 12 and verse 23 through 28. John chapter 12. Notice what it says. In John 12, verses 23 through 28. And Jesus answered them, saying, My hour is not yet come. Are we there? Is that what he said? John chapter 12, verse 23 and 20 through 28. Verse 23 says, And Jesus answered them, saying, My hour is not yet come. No. Are you sure? What does it say? The hour is come. The hour is come. The hour is come. What is Christ talking about? Why is he talking about this hour? What is it about this hour? It has to be very, very important. Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You know, Jesus' holy ambition, his, 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 his drive for holiness and righteousness was, was as high as heaven. Amen? Amen? For him, he was 
as he said on the, the Sermon on the Mount, he was hungering and thirsting for righteousness. He says, the hour is come that the Son of Man be glorified. Now he goes on to explain this in a way that they could understand. A way that we could understand. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth what? Much fruit. It brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, he will, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. How many of us desire to hear God's voice audibly speaking to us? Does anybody desire that? Does anybody want to hear God speaking to them audibly? You know, this wasn't the first time that the Father was speaking to Christ out loud, if you would that all could hear. This was the encouragement that Christ needed at the time. It says in verse 27 that his soul was troubled. What should he do? Should he shrink? Should he uh, be afraid? Should he uh, feel weak? Should he feel discouraged? Uh, should he get depressed? Should he have anxiety? No. No. God is, God is with him. His Father is with him. His Father has been with him. And now is the time, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. How, how was Christ to be glorified? How was he to be glorified? I heard somebody say to die. Does that seem like it? Something that will glorify, glorify you? To die? Hmm? No. But when you understand the mission of Christ, when you understand His purpose, His calling, His work, His business, His business was to save us from our sins. His business was to come and live a sinless, holy, righteous life so that we could have an example, a perfect example. From childhood to manhood, that we could be able to examine with prayer and study and observe this miracle of miracles. And that it would inspire us with that passion that Christ had with that desire that he had, with the life that he had. Hmm. 
What was that hour all about? The hour that had come. It was an hour of self-denial. It was an hour of self-sacrifice. Putting self aside, right? Self-love and self-interest perishing. And it was to meet the need of the world. Amen. This is how we should be. We see the needs of the world, amen? amen? We're in a stupendous crisis right now. Not just with COVID-19, the virus itself. But as I mentioned earlier, and as was mentioned by others earlier, people are losing hope. People are financially challenged, socially challenged, mentally challenged. Even without COVID, people are being physically challenged with other diseases as well and other things. We have to recognize these things as, just let's just say as humans, as humans. Christ wants to give us his divine nature as well. He wants to make us like him to be uh, uh, holy in his sight, to be righteous in his sight. But as humans, we can see the needs of humanity. This is what the hour was about. It was about meeting the need, casting his life into the furrow, if you would, of the world's need. Right? Furrow is for those who may not know that word, we don't, it's an agricultural word. It means the, the, the area in the ground where the seed is supposed to go to be able to die first, yeah. then it will begin to germinate, and it will grow and bear fruit. And that fruit will, guess what? What will it do? What should it do? It should meet someone's need, amen? It should meet someone's need. So God wants to take us through that process. He wants to, he wants to Show us how to die to ourself. Young people, youth, 12 year olds, 13, 11, 10, however old you are, Christ wants to teach you how to die to yourself. That in your life can be germinated this spiritual life. And from that, it'll grow and you'll be able to bear fruit to the glory of God. I want to close just with a testimony. When I was 19 years old, I had a life changing experience. And I was in college, I was studying, and I wanted to find out and I had a question. And at least this is how I see it. <laughs> you know how the Holy Spirit works? We can't understand the Holy Ghost, right? You can try to explain it. But when you talk to God, God will reveal to you exactly what is taking place. You may not understand everything now, but what I understand happened to me is this. I had, a, I had an interest to want to know. It was a question. <laughs> Why, why is it? How is it? Because, you know, I was studying my books. I was into my studies. There has to be something to this Bible. When there were so many people that professed to have some belief in this, this book right here, the Bible. So many Christians, right? So there had to be something to it. And at the time, I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't an atheist either. I believe that there was a God, uh, but I definitely didn't know him and understand him, but I was curious. And, you know, I 
started asking people questions about the Bible. My mother, she had become a Christian as well. And I asked her a question about you know, God, and she recommended to me some things. And one thing that she recommended to me was the thing that changed my life by God's grace forever. Why don't you get some Bible studies? Why don't you have some Bible studies? And I was like, okay, let me, let me think about that. Yeah, that sounds like, I, I'll do that, I'll try that, I'll, I'll, try some, I'll try Bible studies. So, as I said, my mother had become a Christian when I was 12, right? And I started attending church at that time, um, but I had, you know, left and I pretty much went in my own direction. So, she recommended that I have Bible studies and I, there was an elder that I knew from church uh, when I was 12 and 13. And uh, I remember him, remember that elder visiting my house on different occasions for emergencies that came up. And I remember him preaching in church, me being convicted by the Holy Spirit at 12 when he made the appeal. And uh, I had some good memories of him. So what I did, I drove to his house, all right, and I knocked on his door knocked on his door. And I asked him, I said, Elder, I would like to have Bible studies. And he's, you know, he's sitting there, he's, um, they were watching a game on TV. He wanted, he asked me, you want to come watch the game? And, you know, I was into, I was into that, but I, I really wasn't, I didn't want to, I didn't come there to watch the game. I came for Bible studies. You know? And I'm telling you, I was, I was, uh, God was leading me from the world, let me say, at that time. So we sat down and we started studying the Bible over a period of time. And I began to realize for the first time in my life, kind of like how Jesus, when he was 12, it flashed before him what his mission was when he went to Jerusalem at the age of 12. He could see it playing, played out in all the types. He could see his life. It's kind of like that is what happened to me in some sense as I began to study the Bible. The Holy Ghost began to impress my heart that God loved me Amen. and that he had a mission for me. I didn't understand all what it was, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And I love education. But God had a mission for me, and I wanted to fulfill his mission, and I still do, by the grace of God. And I believe that there's a tremendous need in the world for mission areas. Those that are seeking to fulfill God's mission. So at the age of 19, I surrendered my heart to the Lord. Amen. The Lord took my heart, amen, amen, for I could not give it. And one miracle that happened at that time that really sealed it for me, my mother had been no longer attending church at that time of my life. And through my questioning her, asking her, you know, mom, you know, why did you leave church? You know, because I was investigating. I, I wanted to know. And, 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 and she really didn't have answers, right? But when I started my Bible studies, my mother started going back to church. Amen. And I can remember uh, I wasn't going to church, and then she invited me to come to church while I was having my Bible studies. <laughs> and I started going to church while I was studying. And I remember one Sabbath at the appeal, there was an elder that same elder who gave an appeal, you know, at this church they gave solemn appeals, right? Opened up the, the doors of the church, if you would, to invite anyone who feels the Lord calling them to surrender their heart to the Lord at this time. And the appeal was made. Hearts were stirred. My heart was 
God was calling, I know God was calling me to serve him, to surrender all to him. I hadn't yet. And you know what it was that really helped me and encouraged me? That very day, my mother took a stand, a public stand for the Lord. That day. For some reason I was so happy I couldn't I couldn't contain myself. I knew through studying God's word that this was the best decision for her. I hadn't even made it yet. I hadn't made a decision for myself yet, but I knew that she was making the right choice. That was the Holy Ghost. And the, the Lord started speaking to me, saying, Have you made the choice yet, Lawrence? Have you surrendered your heart to the Lord? Have you done the best thing possible for you? And I said, no, Lord, but I need to do it. And I did, by God's grace. Amen. And God wants you to do it today. Amen? Amen. This is my appeal. If there's anyone here under the sound of God's voice, meaning the Holy Ghost is speaking to you at this time, if God is calling you to surrender your heart. Between you and God, you know what God has been sharing with you throughout the course of this week or throughout the course of these last few months. In this pandemic, you know what God has been sharing with you. And I know, if I know God, it is that He loves you. He cares about you. He has a plan for your life. He has a mission for you now. Not later. He has a mission for you right now. And it is better. It is bigger. It is greater. It's going to bear more fruit than anything that you can plan or devise on your own. Anything that anybody else can do for you or give you, God has that for you. So if there's a young person here today that God is speaking to you, I would ask if you would raise your hand. Is there any young person here that God is calling you to surrender your life to Him? You haven't made a decision yet, but you want to do it today. Now is not the time to delay. We're in a crisis, and we don't know how much longer we have. God is calling you today. Is there anyone? Maybe someone older, not a young person, that hasn't yet surrendered their heart to the Lord. speaking to your heart, drawing you by his love, and you want to respond to that today, I would ask if you raise your hand. Is there anyone? One. Amen. See your hand. Amen. See your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask those who raise their hand to come to the front after. We'll, we'll say a special prayer for you. Amen. Is there anyone else? Anyone else who the Lord has been calling you and you want to make that commitment with the Lord. As I close, as I close, even as I pray, even if you want to come up, after we pray, you can come up. You don't have to raise your hand, you can come up front at the end. The Lord is calling you. I'm going to give the closing prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful for your love for us. We're so thankful for how you are patient with us, how you're merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy, Lord, for thousands of them that love you. We're praying that you will move on our hearts, Lord, change us. We want to be like you. We know the hour has come. We can see that all around us, Father. We see the needs all around us. I'm so thankful and I'm encouraged by Northeast Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
We have been introduced, we have been presented with the battle cry. Lord, we know this is your work for us at this time. Equip us for it, prepare us for it, train us, educate us, Lord. We need that true education so that we can finish your work. I will pray that you will seal the decisions that have been made this day. Lord, those who, uh, let, me, let me say, seal the right decisions that have been made this day. The wrong ones, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy, O Lord. Give us time, we pray. And I ask all these things that we pray for forgiveness for our sins and cleansing from all the righteous. Augustus of the Bible.
come by. Because if you don't come, you're going to be mad at yourself. <laughs> so we're looking forward to having you back. Um, we want to thank the young people, if you bear with me just a few more seconds, for taking um, charge of the, young, the Divine Hour today. Every third Sabbath, it's Youth Divine Hour. Annalise, she was a bit nervous giving the children's story. And let me tell you, this young lady is one of the most brilliant young people that I've met. I'm just going to say valedictorian. That's all I'm going to say. And you see how, it's in, how important it is for us to create opportunities Amen. for our young people to develop. Yeah. So we thank you for supporting today. We thank you once again, Ellen Lawrence, for that message that you have presented and uh, for that connection that it brings with the Lord. So keep preaching, keep working for the Lord, because indeed you're a messenger for him. God bless you. Now we'll have the benediction. Once again, we want to remind you, in keeping with the uh, in keeping with the reopening guidelines, we'll ask you to greet at the exit door and then you can gather in the uh, parking area. We're not allowed to have gathering in the foyer. And I've always said well, a few more seconds that we're not encouraging all the members to come out at this time, but those who are ready, we ask you to come. We hear both of you. It's because there's a limited, there's a limit on the capacity that we can allow. So now it's 75%. We hope it gets to 100 so we get to all the members to come on in. But we take it in one step at a time. Amen. God bless you. Thank you again. Let's have the minute.